Over the weekend, I had the absolute pleasure of watching the HBO documentary about the first black supermodel, Ms. Danielle Luna. Now, as a fashion girl, a film graduate, I have always known a little bit about Miss Luna. I also feel that my grandparents had that Vogue cover in their garage. My grandparents had a barrage of like Ebony Essence and Jet magazines and like really just anything that involved black people. They had a copy of it. So I feel like that's the first time I ever saw her. Um, but didn't really know about the history or anything like that. It was just like, oh, look at this black lady. And then when I got to college doing archive work with Christian from House of Christian, shout out to him. Also my co-host on my fashion podcast, That's Hot Pod. Um, I found some pictures of her like in Paco Rabanne and I'll include that here so you can see that. And that was like the first that I saw her in print outside of just that Vogue cover at my grandparents' house. Fidem has a vast magazine archive, so I was able to look at a few things. And that was really all the information I ever had on Miss Luna. Then, a few years ago, Zendaya does a sort of reprisal or in tribute to her in a bunch of her poses for a magazine. And we can put that in, style by Law Roche, of course because they kind of have a similar look, a similar aesthetic. So when this documentary came out, I was all about seeing it. Even when they were advertising, I'm like, oh, I'm for sure going to watch it. And it opened my eyes so much. Because first of all, Miss Luna is from Detroit, and her real name is Peggy. My God, okay, my head burst open. And not just that, seeing that she came from a regular black traditional family, her mom was very fair-skinned, and it's probably due to, you know, slavery and the things that come along with that we ain't got time to get into it here but her mom was very fair-skinned her dad regular brown-skinned black man so clearly Danielle got her complexion and her more exotic features if you want to call them that from her mother's side of her mother's heritage now be that as it may she was a black girl living in Detroit in the whole like car boom era so her family they were well taken care of her parents did have a tumultuous relationship i think they said they got married and divorced like four times uh there may or may not have been domestic violence there may or may not have been alcoholism we are not here to judge the dead but the sister spoke on that a little bit she had two sisters included in the documentary and they look like regular black women one of her sisters kind of she's light-skinned as well but i don't feel that any of these people were white passing my opinion but still light skin. So then Donye, really tall, lanky, doesn't fit in because, you know, black people, we like them thick, especially back then, you know, they like them thick. So she was getting called olive oil, all types of names. Very similar to what Kamora Lee Simmons explains as her uh, childhood, her upbringing in school, being like a tall, skinny white girl. Donye, same. So she's out one day, and this guy that's a photographer, he was hired. Uh, he was a British man. He was hired to come and take pictures at Ford, I believe. And like I said, Detroit Car Hub, Central of America. And he sees Danielle out on her way to school or, or to, to or from school, what have you. And he's like, oh, you're really beautiful. You know, you should be a model. She's taken aback by these comments because probably nobody has ever really called her beautiful. Nobody has ever spoke life into her or gave her any alternatives for what she could do or be. So this really stays with her, and she's only 14 at the time, but once she is old enough to do something about this, she does get on a bus and get gone. All right, she leaves Detroit, she goes to New York, she pops up. She calls the man immediately, like, hey, I'm in New York, can you help me out? He meets up with her. Basically, within the month, you know, they take pictures, she gets submitted to some agencies, she ends up hanging out with Andy Warhol and them at the factory, and they become good friends, or like a fixture, because I don't really feel like Andy Warhol's friends with nobody, you feel me? But just a fixture, they call Andy Warhol the vampire, and a man in the documentary spoke about that, how he kind of sucks the lifeblood of other people and their creativity and absorbs it into his own, so that's why all the cool people were around the factory, you know, being used as blood boys for Mr. Andy Warhol. But anyways, Danielle very quickly starts working with Harper's Bazaar and they put her on the cover but they make her kind of peach and it's a drawing it's a cartoon so you can't really tell it's a black girl boom first line of disrespect then the same photographer that hooked her up and basically got her out here got her acclimated to the scene hooks her up with Herb Ritz and if you don't know who Herb Ritz is, pause this, Google it, come back. He was basically the gatekeeper for fashion and fashion photography at that time, my opinion. And probably largely the opinions of others in the know. So anyway, she's working with Herb Ritz. And Herb Ritz likes her so much, he wants to sign her on. Like, can't no other photographers work with her. But me, this is my girl. This is my muse. 
She's her Vogue, and those are the famous or infamous Paco Rabanne pics that she slayed. And then, you know, they told him, huh, don't do it again. Her, you do this again, you're not going to work here for Vogue no more. So I don't even really know how that cover transpired. But essentially after that, I think it was Diana Veerland. Veerland? I can't say her name correctly. But she was the lady that they were making fun of in Funny Face. You know, Think Pink. She was like, huh. Danya ain't nobody's idea of beauty nobody aspiring to look like this aka nobody want to be no black girl so don't do it again this was a one-time situation and in that time this is the 60s the backdrop is the civil rights all of that movement Danya is completely removed from that and all the ways that really really matter like no she's not on the front lines no she's not being an activist she's not speaking out on behalf but really just her existence in these areas of high fashion high art like she's out with salvador dolly party and turning up he's drawing a dress on her that's essentially art there are not many other black people in these spaces if any so her just being alive being herself moving and shaking is a revolutionary act my opinion but also when she first came to new york she told the photographer guy that put her on like look one of my parents is mexican that's why i look like this and of course that was a clever cover or, you know, a cover of what she could do. You might call it anti-black. But she knows what she's going to be up against. Death is girls from Detroit. She's been black this whole time. She's coming here and she's inventing this character, Donya Luna, in my opinion. Strictly because she knows what's up when you're a black person and how you get treated. And she doesn't want that to be applied to her. So she's not a dummy. But she's actively playing aloof. Playing, you know, the coquettish, if you will. To get around some of this shit. And I'm not mad at that. Because you can't be carrying the whole world on your back. Everybody ain't Malcolm X. Everybody ain't Martin Luther King. I just want to be out. I want to do my art. I want to be beautiful. And I want to be included in the world as a person. I don't necessarily want to have to be a black person everywhere I go. That's not how I feel. But I get that. Especially in those times when it's much more dire. Totally understand. So don't ever watch this and look at Danielle. I mean, if you watch this documentary and think like, oh, she was anti-black or she wanted to be black. Ah, ah, ah. You do not know the pressure that she was under at that time. You do not know the circumstances, the feelings, the thoughts, all of that. So please save your judgment today's eyes, your 2023 glasses. Save that for the 2023 shit, okay? Look at this with your 60s, 50s glasses on and judge accordingly. So. After just getting dissed over and over again in America, I feel that Danielle was very, very heartbroken and decided to take her talents across the pond like many black people at that time were to James Baldwin, were to Josephine Baker, and we're going to go to Europe, okay, because they've had black people out of slavery for longer over there, and although there is racism and feelings of tension, it is less intense than it is here in America, so I'm going to get ghost, okay, I'm going to get in the wind. She goes to London, she goes to Paris, she burns it up. She's the talk of the town. She's the toast. Everybody asking her, oh, Luna, Luna. She's like, my name is Luna. I'm from the moon. She don't want to talk about heritage. She don't want to come talk about where she's from. She don't want y'all investigating. If there was internet back then, she would have been fried. She would have been cooked. And probably all of these images, pictures, opportunities she got, it wouldn't have happened. But thank God she was in the time that she was. And she was able to slip and slide in a certain way. So, boom. She's out there. She's dating rock stars. She's having a good time. She's a part of the it girl crowd. She's doing more work, but still not really being included in the ways that she would like. And then there's a lot of pressure all the time. Social pressure, things going on. She's feeling lonely because as you know, when you are the only black person, although some people pride themselves in that position, when you're the only black person, it gets lonely, it gets dark, especially when you're, I don't want to say lying, but not representing yourself to the truest extent when you've created this character and you're playing along. And then Diana's sisters kind of alluded to that too. They were like, her dad with the whole Diane Luna situation, he didn't like that at all. He hated that because it's like, what, you scared to be black? You afraid to be black? You ashamed to be black? And it's like, he probably not understanding either because he does not get to choose because like I said, he's a brown-skinned black man. But when presenting with the option of choosing, like Meghan Markle, Okay, you choose up. Some people choose up. Some people can't handle the pressure of being black. Like, famously said by Miss Lena Horne, one of the most beautiful black women ever, in my opinion, said she could not handle the pressure of being married to a black man because it was just too much. You, it's inescapable. And she gets to marry this white man and gave her a little bit of a cloak in society to go around and have opportunities and kind of exist without that big old chain that dark cloud over you being a black person in america the struggle is real everybody not built for it so Danya created this character so she could escape she won't be peggy she's Danya luna of the moon all right so she's having a hard time she's getting lonely she's also turning up regularly doing doing a little bit of drugs 
doing a little bit of smoke, a little bit of pop, a little bit of this and that. We're not going to get into specifics. I don't want to get demonetized. But watch the documentary if you want specifics. She was having a good time. She was just chilling. Fashionable friends, the whole thing. Going out to the club, dancing. They said nobody danced like Johnny Luna. All right, she was cutting up. Leaves Europe and goes, well, I'm going to say leaves the UK and goes over to Italy where she falls in love. She meets this man and she's like, she feels like her heart is so open, so full. She never felt this way before. She never felt so beautiful, all of this. And then the man is also in the documentary. I'm not going to say his name because he kind of pissed me off towards the end. And I want to be disrespectful, but you know, watch it anyways. So this man, they can't even speak the same language. They used to just trip out in the park off them substances and, you know, let their bodies talk to each other. Body language, Jen Aiko and Big Sean. Of course, she gets pregnant. They get married at some point. She gets pregnant. She gives birth to baby dream. And she's over the moon. They both are. They're so happy about this baby. They move off into this idyllic countryside kind of chateau manor house thing. They got to fix it up a lot because it's a wreck. And they're doing that for a while. Then this man, this Italian man that she's with, his family starts hating. To me, they've probably been hating the whole time, but the hate gets intense. They start hating. And they're like, oh, you know, this girl not invi- invited into our home because she said she wanted to sprinkle uh weed all over the vatican like in their devout catholics girl that probably wasn't the reason she was black and i feel like this man was never acknowledging that either and that's what kind of annoyed me like maybe your family is just traditional and they know that you didn't bring home a nice italian girl that can understand what they were saying and talk back and make rally- ravioli and all that but he was ignoring 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 so i gotta ignore and just go with what he's saying so he's saying that her comments about the Vatican, and that's why her mom, his mama didn't like her. Okay, cool. Not even invited in the house, even after she had the baby. Him and the baby would go sleep at the parents' house. Danielle would sleep with a friend. Cold-blooded. Segregation. Now, this is what she tried to run away from, and y'all bring it right to her doorstep. Also, the mom starts hating on a different level. Oh, why you out there just in the country, playing house, playing farming with that baby? You need to get a job. You need to work. Like, these people were hippies, artists, creating art, making movies, all of this Afrofuturism. And this mama, traditional hating so he does leave he does end up getting a job but it's far away so essentially you leave this black woman alone in the countryside of italy no friends no family no connection no nothing the only person she really knows is you with this baby by herself so of course she gets depressed so she sinks down into her depression eventually she needs a break watch the documentary they end up going kind of close to the parents house but like i said she's not invited so he takes the baby or she gives the baby to the babysitter she's like she's gonna go stay with friends she ends up dead. They don't want it to me. They didn't really want to say overdose. They're like, oh, she got some money from the lady. The man was saying, oh, we didn't really have no money for no smoke at the time. So she probably tried something different. I don't know. When her friend said she was unresponsive, I said, oh, maybe she took a sleeping pill. Cause You know, she do that sometimes. Like, just, I hated how he was handling the situation. But anyways, her grown daughter dream is also in this documentary. Very confused, in my opinion. Like, she don't know where to place things. She don't really know how to navigate. But she's doing her best because her mom died when she was 18 months old. And she's been raised by these Italians who don't really know nothing about nothing. As far as her mom, Black America, that whole experience. But I think she was probably the impetus for this because she really wanted to connect with her mom. And she wants her granddaughters, who are essentially white at this point, to know who their grandmother was and take some part in that legacy. Which I'm not mad at at all. But this daddy and that family and his just overall nonchalance about the events and how they occurred was very concerning to me. I'm like, bro, what's going on? Anyways, <sighs> this whole thing was very, very sad. And it was like a lot going on because just to see the pain and the struggle that a black person goes through, even when they're tr- even when they are exceptional and they're trying to do things and be the first black person, it shows how much pressure and how lonely that is and how demoralizing and somewhat soul crushing it can be when you're just trying and trying and trying and your art is not being appreciated and doors are being closed on you, even though you're the best. Like when they showed the side by side of her Paco Rabanne picture next to the lady who replaced her in the magazine, it was disgusting. Like, why would you want this? But you're black and I get that. And you, you kind of can't run from it. You can kind of shirk and you can kind of be like, oh, I'm just a person and we're all people. But at the end of the day, it's what the, the wider public sees you as. And they saw you as a black woman, even though you tried to do your little Mexican shuffle. It didn't work out. 
I feel like in Italy, they maybe were more accepting towards her. And that's how we got these beautiful images of her in these like movie roles and stuff. She did say that modeling was just like a side quest for her. And she really wanted to be an actress. She wanted to be a movie star. It's sad that that didn't really happen for her fully in the way that it could have. I would have loved to see. And she died so young, too. I would have loved to see her in like some. Uh, I don't want to say black exploitation, but that was what was popping at the moment. Like some Pam Greer type, but on her level, like Afrofuturist and sci-fi and all that. I would have loved to see more of that. Like her in Dune and it just would have been beautiful. I feel like so many opportunities were missed, but this documentary was absolutely incredible. I learned so much. So I definitely recommend that you go watch if you're a fan of fashion and you want to learn more. Please do not forget to subscribe if you're on YouTube and follow on TikTok. I really enjoy making this comment and you subscribing, leaving comments and engaging with me is how I can continue to do this. So I really appreciate you. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.